can you start off just telling us how this book came into being? That's kind of an origin story about the book. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, it's a kind of, um, as, as you pointed out, an unusual book for me because usually I write fairly academic books aimed at other academics or else textbooks aimed at students. And this one really is for everybody, I hope. Um, but it was written really by invitation. Um, a couple of years ago, my friend and colleague and uh, frequent um, interlocutor, Evan Thompson, uh, published a lovely book with Yale University Press called Why I Am Not a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an interesting set of um, responses to that book, including one that I wrote, um, but it generated a fairly lively dialogue. And um, my editor at Princeton University Press, Rob Tempio, called me and said, hey, we'd kind of like you to write something in response, but like Evan's book, aimed at a popular audience and, um, you know, not too long and not too difficult. And I said, well, I'm not going to write a book called Why I Am a Buddhist. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what we want. Um, what we want you to do is to pick up some issue that Evan addresses there and just write a different perspective on that. And so one of the chapters in Evan's book um, is called No Self, Not So Fast, where Evan criticizes Buddhist notions of no self and defends the reality of the self. So I said, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to respond to that one. And so I thought that shouldn't be too difficult. I'll write a book um, about why there's no self. And that should be easy because that's something I've thought about for a long time. And I discovered that it's really, really hard um, because the constraints that one has to satisfy are hard to satisfy at the same time. It has to be short enough that somebody might want to read it. It has to be clear enough that somebody can read it. Um, and it has to not be dumbed down too much because I don't like writing dumbed down stuff. And if I did, my colleagues would get upset with me. So to try to write it in a way that it wasn't dumbed down, that really does show respect for my readers and for the material, but is also clear and short, turned out to be really, really hard, but really fun. And it forced me to think these things through again, which is a great reason to write books and to, and to think about things. So that's the origin story. Um, and um, that's... There, there we have the book and the book is out now actually it came out a few days ago and, and it's, it's and you succeeded in what you wanted to do and it's such a worthwhile thing to have it out there i think um one thing that surprised me uh in the in the structure of the book was that before you set out to disprove the illusion of the self you first set out to uh convince us that we do think we have a self and and that was i thought a funny a funny thing to do why did you set up the problem that way I think that's really important, um, and here's why. A lot of people um, will deny that they think they have a self. They think that that's just a really old superstition. And Chandra Kirti, who's one of the, the big heroes of this book, I mean, um, the two big heroes for this book are Chandra Kirti and Hume, not surprisingly, two people around who I've orbited for a very long time. Um, Chandra Kirti has this wonderful analogy that I begin with. Um, where he talks about a guy who is pretty sure that a snake has taken up residence on the wall of his house, which if you live in India is a problem. Um, and he's really worried. So to calm himself down, he looks around the house, convinces himself that there are no elephants there and relaxes. Um, and Chandra Kirti says, what an idiot this guy would be. Um, and the analogy is really clear, but really interesting. Um, it's that we very often tell ourselves, oh, I don't believe there's a self because I don't believe that I'm identical to my body. Or I don't believe I'm identical to my mind. Or I don't believe that in some narrative self or something, right? But then there's still this atavistic sense of selfhood that lies behind that, that we never really deal with. And so I want to make it clear what the object of attack here is, what Tibetan philosophers call the object of negation. And the object of negation isn't some abstract theoretical posit. The object of negation isn't my body, it isn't my mind, it isn't my personal history. It's this very easy, powerful illusion that we get sucked into, that there's something that lies behind that. And I think that if we don't get clear about what that target is, then it's really easy for arguments for the self to look better than they are, and for arguments against the self to make it look like they're missing the point. So I want to get that focus there first, that when we think talking about the self, we're not talking about the body. We're not talking about the mind. We're not talking about the continuum of my psychological events. We're talking about that thing we think has a body, that has a mind, that does the thinking, that is the agent, that is the subject. 
that simple transcendental ego lying behind all of this. Um, that's the thing we're after. Now, my view is that um, we've got an instinct to posit that self and that it's very powerful and very hard to escape. And then a lot of philosophy of mind, not only in the West, but in India as well, China as well, is then built upon trying to take that atavistic intuition and turn it into theory. Um, and to my mind, that's a terrible thing because you start out with an illusion. It would be, it would be as though the, the analogy that I use throughout the book is the Bueller liar illusion. And I only use that because it's so easy to do <laughs> and, and everybody got a prop. Thank you. That's beautiful. Right. So right. That, that line on the top really looks like it's shorter than the line on the bottom, even though they're exactly the same length. And <clears throat> noticing that we get sucked in by the illusion is an important thing to notice. But you wouldn't respond to that by saying, wow, now let's figure out how arrowheads make lines grow and shrink. You would try to figure out why we get sucked in by the illusion. But first, you have to convince yourself that you get sucked in. If you're the kind of person who says, nah, I would never look at two equally long lines and think they were different, mm -hmm. then, then it can't get going. So I want to begin by convincing us that just as we're wired to be sucked in by the mueller liar illusion, we're wired to be sucked in by the self-illusion. And it's mm -hmm. that thing that we're wired for that I want to go after. Mm -hmm. And I think the, your strategy is good, right? The, the one way of thinking about it is that we're addicted to this concept of the self and it's very hard to overcome addictions without mm -hmm. replacing it with something or even habits, right? It's to, yeah. to set a new habit, you have to, or break an old habit, you have to set a new habit. Um, so you offer us a new habit uh, of way of thinking. So in place of the self, we're now to think about things in terms of personhood. And I, I know I know I could have shared my screen and that would be cool. Um, but, I, <laughs> but I my teacher brain took over and I like made a handout. Um, so the, there's these like different distinctions that Jay offers in the book between a self and a person. Um, some of the primary ones being that the self is independent, it's uh, given, it's stable, it's unified, it has priority, all these things. Um, and especially I think that it's a, a, a free actor who's over against the world. Um, mm -hmm. And then that the person on the other hand is a way of thinking about your identity that's interdependent, um, conventionally given, um, mm -hmm. and very much embedded in the world and, um, and non-dualist. Yeah. Um, so here's, here's her, like, that's the move to try to get out of our addiction. But one, one thought I kept run, running up against that you didn't address in the book is, well, what, it, what makes us so sure that it's a uniform field? Couldn't it well be the case that some people have selves and some people do not, either by biology or culture? Um, so I'm thinking particularly about um, people on the autism spectrum who are neurodivergently um, wired um, and who really seem to, you know, autism, the name derives from autos, from the self, there really does seem to be something different going on with the, um, the identity, the self-perception, the way of being in the world um, of people on the spectrum um, than people who are neurotypically wired. Um, to take it, and then we can easily imagine too, I think an example from like an American subculture of people who culturally or uh, produce really, who really do um, have a sense of themselves uh, that it remains, remains unified over time. Like why couldn't it be the case that some people have selves and, what, and some people don't? Okay, that's a really good question. It's a really tricky question. Um, so let me begin by um, talking about the neurodiversity issue and then move to the cultural diversity issue because they're actually slightly different. Mm -hmm. Um, the first thing to say, which is not maybe directly relevant, but might be worth keeping in, in focus, is that when we talk about people who are on the autism spectrum, um, very often, the further out you go in that spectrum into something like full-blown autism or Kanner syndrome, um, we find people who not only don't represent others as being centers of consciousness or agency, but don't represent themselves as being centers of consciousness or agency either. And mm -hmm. so it's not as though by autism, we mean somebody who's got a really strong self. We mean often somebody who doesn't have the self illusion at all mm -hmm. um, because they don't thematize self identity. 
um, that might be one of the few good things about being um, being in, in in that kind of region of the spectrum is that you don't necessarily thematize self so much. Now, there's a lot of other problems. I don't want to suggest that that's a good reason to to um, to want to be in that position, but I don't think that we'll, it's fair to say that people on that spectrum have a stronger sense of self or more likely to have a self. But the big difference, the big issue to talk about, and this is the one that is um, relevant to both of the examples that you gave, is this. It's one thing to talk about, to ask the question, does somebody have the sense that they've got a self? And another thing to ask, do they actually have one? Mm -hmm. And it might well be, and certainly is, there's some cultural groups, some subcultures, who are really deeply committed to the reality of a self. Um, and that's in, often the case in uh, very serious religious communities that are committed to the existence of a soul um, or the existence of um, an Atman that, pre that continues through rebirth and so forth. But it's important to see that being more and more convinced that you've got one doesn't make you right any more than being more and more convinced that Santa Claus is real makes him realer. So even though there's lots of kids who believe in Santa Claus, it would be wrong to go from that to say that there are lots of kids in whose lives Santa Claus is real. That just means there's lots of kids who are really convinced of a particular myth, not that that particular myth is real in that particular group. Um, the arguments that I offer in the book are arguments both philosophical, psychological, neuroscientific, to suggest that once we explore what we would mean by a self, a unified subjective agency, a free actor, something standing against the world, something that's intrinsically different from an object, something that's the precondition of consciousness and a unifier, no matter, once you spell that out, there's no way to make it coherent. There's no way to make it make sense at all, given what we know. So that if you believe that what we really are, are interdependent, biologically and socially embedded organisms, um, to find somebody who had a self, you'd have to find somebody who wasn't like that. Somebody who wasn't a biological organism interdependent with everything else in space and time. Something, somebody who was somehow extrinsic to all of that. And that we just don't find at all. Um, uh, so I think that we can certainly ask the question, are there differences among cultures and among individuals with regard to how strongly they hold on to the self-illusion? But you can't ask the question, are there beings who really have selves and answer, oh yeah, those ones do, we just don't happen to. Because it's not something that you might or might not have, like a cow. Some people have got cows, some people don't have cows. Cows make sense though. You know what they look like, you know what they smell like. Mm, um, they can be measured like the lines. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cells aren't like that. So I think if the argument in the book is correct, then it's not an argument that suggests that, oh, we could have had one, but we don't. It's that the self doesn't make any sense at all, but the person does. Mm. Somebody in the chat was recommending a book that I really want to check out called Neurotribes um, that might go deeper into the question of uh, the, the, the many different kinds of people on the spectrum, um, some of whom I love very much, and um, the, the ways that they might experience self differently. And I think that's something I want to learn more about. Um, but the, I think that the underlying, the question that's underlying the idea of maybe some people really do have a self is, is can be expressed also as the idea is being under the illusion of self really such a bad thing? Obviously you argue that it is for all these ethical reasons, but Nietzsche is a philosopher who comes to the mind as, as um, making the case really persuasively that humans need certain illusions in order, in order to flourish. Um, we need the historical illusion. Um, we need the illusion of agency. Maybe, maybe the illusion of self is one of those that we need. And I was trying to think of examples that might substantiate that point of view. And again, Socrates came to mind um, whose daemon his 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 uh, his spirit or his conscience, who speaks to him and tells him not what to, what what not to do, um, might might well qualify as, as something like a self. Um, but it seemed to me that in in those cases, like the the illusion of a self, can buttress one's ability to stand against the crowd, to be a nonconformist, um, to transform 
uh, your conditions or, or even your bodily reality from something that was given to you into another, um, another life through the motivating idea or illusion of this is my true self. Like this is, uh, this is who I was meant to be and who I'm going to become. Um, so it seemed to me that there's, there's a case to be made that in some cases, the self-illusion could be a very good one indeed. Yeah, I like that question. And I like the fact that you started with Nietzsche. Because um, I think of Nietzsche who's somebody on my, who's somebody on my team on this one. Yeah. Um, and you're right that Nietzsche does suggest that some myths are really kind of um, important for us in understanding our, ourselves historically. But if we look at what's really my favorite Nietzschean text, and that's uh, Twilight, um, and in particular, my favorite section of that text, which is the Maxims and Arrows, um, one of the more powerful sections there is um, Nietzsche arguing against the myth of the self um, and arguing that what we do when we construct the idea of the self is we effectively sublimate our self-understanding. Um, we take it from the understanding of a human being, of somebody who is a member of a culture, who's got a history, um, who is embedded in a world, to the idea of somebody standing outside of the world with some kind of transcendence. And he thinks that kind of transcendence um, is just crazy. Um, it's crazy because it ends up deprecating the physical and embodied part of our existence. Um, it's crazy because it um, presupposes a kind of cultural historical autonomy that we don't have and that involves a kind of agency that makes it impossible for us to act, ask about the actual causes of our behavior. Um, Nietzsche was too much of a naturalist um, to believe in a self. Um, though he was enough of a naturalist to understand that it is natural for us to be sucked in um, by that belief. Now, mm -hmm. it's certainly true of lots of um, false views or lots of uh, myths that sometimes it can be psychologically useful to believe in those myths. Um, and, some, and that could be true for different reasons for different people at different times. I don't think that it makes the myths true. It might make them useful, convenient fictions for a while. But in this particular case, I think that there's enough that is harmful in the self-myth that whatever benefits we buy, we buy at very huge costs. So for instance, you talked about the, um, the value of, of, of trying to find my true self or my core self, which might mean discarding certain parts of my identity and taking up other parts of my identity. This could be true in a lot of different ways, right? It could be true with respect to gender, it could be true with respect to national identity, religious identity, all kinds of things where I say, I was born this way, but this isn't really me. Um, one way to understand that intuition or that drive is to think, well, there's two things here. There's the self, there's myself, and then there's what I've become, and I want to get back to that self. Um, unfortunately, what that does is it denies the agency that I have in my self-construction. Um, and it also succeeds in denying the agency that others have collaborating with me and, and uh, constructing who I am, sometimes for good, sometimes for ill. Um, but if I want to reconstruct myself with a different identity, if I want to become a different person, I need to take responsibility for that. Um, and I need to think that who I am is causally determined, that who I am is part of a narrative that I've got some agency in writing, but that other people have got some agency in writing as well. Um, and that requires not that I embrace a self, because then I'm embracing something that's kind of weirdly permanent and stable and immutable, but rather embrace flexibility, um, embrace mutability, embrace the possibility of change and of writing a new, a new script or a new narrative, um, occupying a, a, a different kind of character than the one I've been occupying. Mm -hmm. um, and that, for my money, means discarding the self. Um, when we buy the self, um, we might get this sense of power, autonomy, um, individuality, independence. Um, but I think each of those is a really pernicious idea. So well, here's one way of putting that. In American culture in particular, but in a lot of the world's cultures, we hear people say things like, 
you have to learn to stand on your own two feet. Um, you've got to be independent. You've got to think your own thoughts. You've got to be creative. Um, and I'm thinking to myself now, so exactly what does that mean, standing on my own two feet? It means, well, do I have to grow my own food? All of it. Do I have to make the dirt in which it grows and to cause the rain? Um, do I need to, um, we, to, to spin my own thread, weave my own fabric, um, sew my own clothes? Um, do I need to create my, invent my own language? Um, and make sure that I don't read anything that anybody else has ever written. And in particular, don't talk to anybody else because I might be infected by their arguments. This is not a recipe for healthy life. Right? <laughs> this is a recipe for psychosis. Um, instead, I find it much more useful to say, what I've got to do is remember my interdependence. Um, remember to whom I ought to be grateful. Um, remember how I've got where I am, and if I'm not happy with where I am, how to get someplace else. Um, to remember that we function in kind of ensembles, and I can never claim credit for everything that I take myself to have done, um, nor can I deny my agency in what we actually do. Um, and all of that is about exploding the self-idea, which really is that idea of somebody standing on his or her own two feet and... Uh, being autonomous. And I just don't think anybody's ever been like that. Mm -hmm. Well, and to me this, if the self is such a damaging illusion, why is it such a persistent one? And in the book, you, you at one point you touch on it and then you say, oh, it's really outside the scope of the book. But it seems to me that if we want, if we're serious about trying to undo a notion of the self, then we need to have a really firm grip on why it is um, that it is so enduring. And I, I don't think we can blame the philosophers for this one. I don't think it's no. that <laughs> as much as there might be a cottage industry of philosopher apologists for the illusion of self, um, not enough people are reading philosophy and justifying their ideas of their self that, that this is um, the dominant force behind behind why this idea keeps, keeps cropping up. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You can't blame the philosophers for the illusion. You can only blame them for ramifying it um, into theory. You can blame them for that, though. That's OK. That's um, fair. The Tibetan philosopher Tsongkhapa um, said, you know, there's basically two kinds of self-grasping. There's philosophical self-grasping that requires this kind of philosophical theory. Um, and then he said there's innate self-grasping. And he points out, just as you did, that the self-grasping we care about can't be the philosophical self-grasping because then you would only worry about doing this in philosophy departments and those just aren't the only places where the self-illusion crops up um lots of people who don't do philosophy lots of people who don't even think very hard um succumb to the self-illusion in fact we all do i think looking at its origins is really complex and really interesting um I do think that it's quasi-biological or maybe literally biological in, in some sense. That is that we've evolved for this illusion in the same way that we've evolved for the Mueller-Lyer illusion. So that when we look at the Mueller-Lyer illusion, we don't say, oh gosh, we could just get past that. Um, even, when you, even when you've drawn the lines yourself, <laughs> you watch them change apparent length, right? So we're just, our visual systems have evolved to succumb to that particular illusion. Um, it's a spandrel on other things in our, that our visual system does well, like detecting edges and parsing scenes. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect, though I, I cannot prove this, that the self-illusion is a spandrel as well. And it's a spandrel on um, proprioception and interoception and threat detection and things like that that make it very important for us to know physically where we are in the world. Um, what the boundary is between our organism and other things, what we need to do to get away from threats, things like that, and what we need to do to get things closer to us. And so that all the proprioception and interoception that tells us where we are and how we're feeling and what we're doing, I suspect has a spandrel on it that kind of thinks of ourselves as these simple point instants in the same way that our visual system's got the spandrel in edge detection that gives us the mueller lyer illusion. But I also think that the um, eighth century Buddhist philosopher Shantideva was right, um, and Hume was right in, in, um, in, in the West, to point out that there's also an affective dimension to this. That it's one thing to say that we've got this kind of biological pre predisposition, but then we have to ask what really triggers it and what really makes it, um, gives it its robustness 
and it's emotional valence. Um, Shanti Deva thinks it's a lot of it's about the fear of death. Um, and that that's um, that we posit the self as a kind of bulwark against that fear. Um, um, Ernest Becker and his um, uh, terror management theory suggests something very, very similar. Um, Hume points out that the sense of self really comes up in contexts of pride and contexts of shame, um, where we have this referent, we, we construct the sense of self as the object of, of pride or shame. Shanti Deva says that it's in moments of anger um, that, the, that the sense of self comes up. But I think that all of these intuitions are right, that it's in highly emotionally charged situations that we tend to have the strong sense of, I was wronged, or you did this to me, um, or, oh my God, how could I have done that? That really brings up that illusion and raises it to the idea of an object that we think of um, in this very robust way. Now, I have no evidence for any of this. These are all conjectures, um, but I do think that given the universality and the power of the illusion, that it does make sense to kind of ask what the uh, what its evolutionary history is, what its psychobiological um, history is, and what its social history is. And I suspect that all of these things are in play. One of the, um, one of the aspects of human beings that makes us so interesting is that we exist at this kind of intersection of the biological, the psychological, and the social. And so, so much of what is true of each of us requires explanation, not just biologically, but also culturally, also affectively, um, also cognitively. And I suspect that the self-illusion is like that. To really understand its full texture, we've got to talk about the affective, we've got to talk about the cognitive, we've got to talk about the biological, and we've got to talk about the cultural. Yeah, and the economic, right? Like today, it's, it's oh, yes. commonly said that the on social media, the currency is uh, authenticity, right? Or something known as like the true self. So that that's partly cultural, but it's also partly yeah. there's an economic imperative now to market yourself um, and to present a, a self that's even if it's changing the the you know can be fit under the the theory of the narrative self. Yeah. Um, there's very strong economic incentives to buy into that, and I'm, I'm not just talking about the self help industry, right? There's um, uh, something deeply appealing about that shortcut that allows um, people to feel like they can relate to you, um, and that yeah. that can be a, a a driver of of the illusion of self. I think that's important, and and one th reason I'm thinking about that is because I think one of the um, one of the really powerful metaphors you keep coming back to this is my last prop, I think, mm -hmm. um, is the analogy of a dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, and and so you often come back to this idea that the, the self is we buy into the idea of the self in the same way that we buy into the idea of a dollar. I wanted to ask if you could could run that through for people here too. Absolutely, absolutely. So what you really need there are two props you need the dollar and you need a stack of four quarters right it's, I, it's rare i even have cash <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah me too <laughs> but i have my digital i have my digital dollar here as well yeah well that's cool too i mean you can have the digital wallet you can have the and you can have the paper dollar so let's let's imagine for a minute a um i you come up to amherst to meet me and um you don't have enough money to pay for the parking meter so i give you uh, four quarters and the next time you come up, you pay me back with a dollar note, with that particular dollar note. And I say, okay, uh, Kiara paid me back the dollar that I lent her. Um, well, you didn't give me the same coins that I gave you. Um, I never gave you a piece of paper. You never, never gave me the coins, but you still did pay me back that same dollar. Um, on the other hand, when I gave you the four quarters, I gave you the dollar. When you gave me the piece of paper, you gave me the dollar. So now if we ask the really tricky question, and this, this is the important question, um, is the dollar that you paid me or that I gave you identical to or different from the $1 note or the four quarters? On the one hand, it's not different from it because if I never gave you four quarters, I would have never given you a dollar. That's how I gave you a dollar. And if you didn't give me the dollar note, you wouldn't have paid the dollar back. That's how you did it. On the other hand, the four quarters and the dollar note are distinct from each other. So it can't be 
that the dollar is identical to those four quarters, or you would have to give me those four quarters back to pay it. So it's neither identical to nor different from that. Moreover, moreover, and things get really interesting here. When we ask, gee, what makes that dollar note a dollar? Um, notice that it's not the value of the paper and ink because a $20 note has got paper and ink that's worth exactly as much, but the $20 note is worth 20 times as much. Um, and so the, the value of that depends upon a whole lot of things. It depends upon the Federal Reserve. It depends upon the willingness of people to accept that in exchange for chocolate bars or lattes. Um, if people stop, willing, stop being willing to accept it, it stops being worth anything, no matter what we say. Confederate money doesn't work anymore, and there's a good reason for that. Um, so what makes it a dollar not only isn't something that is identical to its properties, but it's an entire network of practices and conventions. And I think that's a wonderful analogy for what makes you, Kiara, and me, Jay, and makes us the persons that we are. Um, I'm neither identical to nor different from the body that I'm in right now. I'm not identical to it because, hey, it used to be that this body was young and strong and had lots of hair and stuff like that, and it's not anymore, but I'm still around. Um, I'm not different from it because it's not as though there are two things here, my body and me. I didn't have to think to bring my body to this Zoom. Um, it just came right along. Um, so I'm neither identical to nor different from any of that. Um, and instead, I need a large number of social and cognitive processes to get personal identity going, just like we need a whole banking system and system of transactions to get the dollar going. And so I think it makes much more sense to think of persons as like dollars and bodies or bodies and minds like quarters and, and pieces of paper than it does to think in terms of selves. We would never ask, where's the self of that dollar bill that makes it worth a dollar? Um, it wouldn't make any sense at all. Rather, we ask about the relations into which it enters, its history, the way that it's used. And those are the questions we should be asking about ourselves. Then we get a much deeper understanding of who we are. Mm. So the payoff, to, to stick with our, our language, the payoff of accepting this idea that we are persons rather than selves, you claim, is in the ethical realm. And this is like really where the book kind of lights up and you can see all this like painstaking work of doing brick by brick argumentation and refutation of all the different theories of self that might be out there, uh, like comes into a blaze. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you're like, this is what it's for. Um, this, once we dispense with the idea of the self, we get away from moral ego, the foundation of moral egoism falls away. Um, and instead we end up with a Buddhist ethics of in which you highlight friendliness, care, sympathetic joy, impartiality. It seems from the chat that at least, at least some people will have some familiarity with those concepts. Um, and we can we can get more into that in the Q&A, um, which I expect will be lively. Um, but I, I wanted to just push on the idea that we would necessarily come to those same four values, even if we accept the premise that we are persons rather than selves. And the, the situation I particularly have in mind centered on the affect of anger. And so you quote from How to Lead an Awakened Life, one, one stanza of which is, um, so when one sees anyone, whether friend or foe, perform an unreasonable action, one can think this has been brought about by conditions and so one can remain content. Mm -hmm. And there's other things in the poem as well that are important and relevant. Um, but there's, there's been a philosophical case made recently um, by Maisha Cherry that Mm -hmm. um, certain kinds of anger are really important and productive, right? And she specifically speaks uh, details a concept of uh, Lordian rage from Audre Lorde, which is yeah. interesting because it's it's an inclusive anger, a selfless anger, an anger that um, isn't mad that this thing happens to me, my ego, myself, but that this thing could happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. And so you see the same value there of a move away from um, selflessness, but um, at the same time, uh, an embrace of a, an affect, a strong affect of anger that would be um, sanctioned, I guess, within the Buddhist ethics that you're laying out. So the question is, uh, why should we, why should we commit to these, to this particular ethical position, even once we 
uh, even if we grant the, the argument that we are persons rather than selves. Okay, so you've actually asked a couple of different questions um, that are rolled together. So I want to distinguish them and take them one by one. Um, one question is, why should we embrace the, um, the Buddhist ethical perspective that I defend here, the kind of moral phenomenology of Buddhism um, in terms of the Brahma Viharas, these divine states um, that, that, that you retailed? Another is, another question is, why should we forego anger? And what do we make of the kind of pro-anger um, moralists who are, who are writing now? And that, that's a big debate right now, pro-anger versus yeah. anti-anger people. Right. I'm clearly was, on, on the anti-anger side. And I, I, I think Cherry's book is really interesting, but I do disagree with it very deeply. Um, so those I would say two, that's the, the spark, the case that sparked the question. That's how I yeah, would yeah, no, but It's a good question. They're both good questions. Um, so um, the, first answer, the first part of the answer has to do with how we understand anger and what anger does to us. So anger is a very powerful affective state. Um, it's also, I think, and here I'm following you know, both Hume and Shantideva in thinking that anger is an essentially um, egocentric state. Um, that is, anger arises when I think there, something has happened that is harmful to me or um, harmful in a way that, um, that reflects a violation of my values. That I'm, that I'm right there in that one. Um, but moreover, anger also, because it's a powerful affective state, um, is a real judgment clouder. Um, and it's a judgment clouder that, as we know, leads us to do and say stupid shit. Um, nobody ever has said, gosh, I'm really glad I got really angry. I'm always at my best and think my clearest when I'm really angry. Nobody ever believes that um, because anger really does hijack our cognitive, um, our cognitive resources. The other thing about anger is that anger always involves an attribution of agency um, to those um, at whom we're angry, taking them to have been kind of... Um, authors of actions, free authors of actions um, that somehow are, are the cause for anger. So we don't get angry at people who, for things we take to have been accidental, to things we, um, that we take to have been caused by, say, mental illness um, or caused by coercion or things like that. And this um, leads us to recognize a really weird fact about our moral psychology and our thinking about attributions of responsibility and guilt and justifications for anger. And that is that we draw a strong distinction between what we take to be free actions and what we take to be caused. Um, and once we draw that distinction, we're in trouble because now we take it that some of our actions are caused and some of them aren't. And it's the ones that aren't that might be the um, possible targets of anger or other even positive moral emotions. Um, pride or um, approval or something like that. Um, and the moment we do that, we've also kind of falsified human psychology and human action. Because even if somebody does something that we regard as really terrible, um, whatever they did was caused by something. Um, Shanti David gives us the beautiful analogy in that same passage from which you quoted. He said, if somebody beats me with a stick, I don't get angry at the stick because I know that it was propelled by his arm. Should I get angry at the arm? Um, well, no, I don't wanna get angry at the arm. Should I get angry at the intention? Well, the intention was caused by something too, by a belief or an emotion. Where do I go to do this? How, do I, how far do I go back before I find something that's uncaused? So I think that anger both reflects um, an inadequate and unjustifiable understanding of human action and causes us to behave in ways that we're, we're in which we're less than at our best. Um, and so, and um, implicates a kind of egocentricity. Now, that's not to say that we need to approve of everything that's around us. Um, we should disapprove of racism and of sexism and of all kinds of other things, right? 
of inequality, of environmental degradation, of selfishness, of violence, of all of these things. But we can disapprove of them in an impersonal way that doesn't involve powerful affect. And if we do that, we tend to be much more effective um, at dealing with those problems. There's a nice analogy here. Anybody who has um, studied martial arts knows that one of the first things you get taught is that if you're in a fighting or a sparring situation, get your emotions out of it. Don't respond with anger because you're gonna get beat up badly by anybody who's reasonably calm. Um, that even if you want to hurt somebody, the best, I'm not recommending this by the way. <laughs> even if you did want to hurt somebody, the best way to hurt them is by being calm, not by being angry. And if you want to help somebody or to ameliorate a situation, whether it's an interpersonal situation or a broad social or political situation, the best way to do that is to get your ego and your affect out of the way and to think clearly. And I think the self-illusion tends to draw in these kinds of pathological affects and then to reinforce those path the, the pathological um, uh, illusions of self in my own person and somebody else's person that just ratchet things up and make it harder to uh, resolve problems. It's really rare that we see problems resolved because everybody gets really angry at each other. Uh, problems get resolved when people can put the anger and the personal involvement aside and actually ask about the situation. I can see that other people are going to uh, bring the, the question about anger into the Q&A. So I, I want to go towards what I felt like was a, a gap in the book, which is what these ethical commitments might mean for our political commitments. Um, and in particular today, one of the dominant uh, political ideologies, let's say, is um, identity politics, right? Mm -hmm. Coming out of the 1960s Kambahi River Collective, we believe that the most profound and potentially the most radical politics come directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to end somebody else's oppression. Um, to be recognized as human, levelly human is enough. Um, so I'm wondering um, whether you have thoughts about uh, to what extent the illusion of self plays into identity politics, to what extent a commitment to personhood does or does not commit to an identity politics, which, which has had gains as well as losses, right? Like it has, there's critiques of it and there's also the obvious, um, obvious wins that identity politics has brought about for various marginalized groups. So I was wondering if you thought about including a chapter there, if it just felt like going into the weeds too much. Well, there was a point, I mean, I was given a pretty powerful word limit <laughs> This book. I already exceeded it and I couldn't go every place. So I didn't mm. go into the political dimensions of things. Um, there just wasn't space. In my book on Buddhist ethics, I did. Um, um, but I'm not trying to sell that book. <laughs> um, the, um, I think identity politics has been and continues to be a double-edged sword. Um, it can be a powerful motivator when it's a vehicle for constructing solidarity. Um, it can be extremely corrosive when it becomes a vehicle for constructing um, boundaries and hostilities between people of different identities. And it can become liberating when we can understand the ways in which the persons we have become um, are uh, depend upon the communities to which we belong. But it can become paralyzing when we see the identities with which we identify as um, defining exactly who we are and who we can be. Um, so I think to the extent that we can pursue identity politics in a way that builds solidarity and liberation, it can be a really good thing. To the extent that it becomes a way of drawing battle lines and of freezing our sense of who we are and of eliminating possibilities, it becomes really dangerous. Notice that the first way is a way of building a self into it. And the second way is seeing identity in terms of the identity of persons and not selves. Okay, hardest maybe, and second to last question also. Um, so I'm sure you're aware of Foucault's work on the practices of, of selfhood, the techniques, the art of self. And so now we need to know how, how do we unself? What are the practices, the techniques of unselfing? That's really, really hard. Um, notice, for instance, that if you ask me, what are the practices in which I could engage in order to stop being 
uh, susceptible to the Mueller liar illusion. I would say there just aren't any who are wired for that. Um, there are people who are convinced that there are practices that we in which we can engage to reduce the self illusion. And those are very often meditative or contemplative practices that involve developing really different habits of thought. Um, I'm gonna be agnostic about whether those work or not, because I really don't know. Um, but I do know that if there's a way of transcending the susceptibility to the illusion, it's really, really hard. On the other hand, I think that by thinking really clearly and by being really attentive um, to the determinants of our own behavior and our own affect and those of others, we can kind of learn to bracket and step back from the kind of worst instances of, um, of the self-illusion. But that requires constant practice um, and constant attention. And I think it's really hard because I think we're, we are talking about something that's an instinct, it's something that's natural. And part of the moral of my book is just because something's natural, that doesn't make it a good thing. Um, so that it sometimes does make sense to rebel against our own nature and become a little bit better than we've evolved to become. Thank you. I have taken up more than my fair share of the time. So I just want everyone to know that we're going to go and if, if you have time, Jay, to stay until 10, 10 past, let's say, yeah. do you have something right after this? Okay. Um, then I will just ask the, the signature last question I always ask, which is, and then turn it over to the, to the audience Q&A, um, which is, what's the question that you wish I had asked? Oh, that's a really interesting one. Um, the question that I wish you would have asked. I don't know. I'm Best not going to give you an answer to that one. <laughs> You've asked such good questions. It's been such a really nice discussion. I don't have any thank complaints. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let me hop over to my Q and A. Open up this window. Yeah. The um, there. <laughs> let's see. And they're really rolling in. Okay. Uh, and apologies in advance for any ignorances I have around name uh, pronunciations, but. Uh, Kim Jung Kim, how can we distinguish the Buddhist discussion on the self understood in an epistemological ethical dimension, agency, etc., and that on the self understood in ontological metaphysical dimension, essence, atman, substantiality? Yeah, um, that's a, a deep and difficult question. Thank you very much for that one. Um, and I'm going to give a shallow and trivial answer, um, but maybe maybe a somewhat useful one. I think that the, the metaphysical dimension is probably, or the phenomenological dimension, I guess I'd, I'd rather say, is really at the ground there. The idea that we really do have this instinct to think of ourselves in a particular way. And that gives rise to um, epistemological illusions. Like for instance, the illusion that I know my own inner life immediately. Um, that I've got a deep privileged access to my own thoughts and my own way of being, that my experience is something happening in an inner space. But notice that once we do that, all of those epistemological ideas then reinforce the ontology that we've got. So now I think, oh, gee, I've got this immediate access to this inner space. Well, that inner space must be real because I've got it. I see it right there. And so I think they're kind of bound up in this vicious spiral um, and our task is to turn that into a virtuous spiral, um, maybe by first questioning how much we really know about ourselves, how much our ethical, um, we can justify ethically thinking of ourselves as selves and use that as motivation to unwind the ontological part of that. But I think they're deeply implicated. Um, and I think the, the core there is actually the phenomenology, this kind of structuring of our experience in terms of self and other. Mm. I'm gonna combine two questions that I think are, um, both of them are addressing technical aspects in the book that you that you do well in the book, but we didn't get into in this conversation. Mm -hmm. So one is from Adam Gent and he's referencing Anil Seth's book. And he says, Anil Seth, Seth describes the self as a process of perceptual experience, including memory, emotions, the experience of agency. So there is no essence, but that doesn't mean there isn't the legitimate experience of having self. I'm a bit unclear whether Jay would agree with that, 
it's some ways he's on the same page, but dot, 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 and some ways not. Um, and Greg, in a, if, it, if it's not too much to add Greg's, Greg Bartel's question as well, he's also asking about an intersubjective narrative self. Is Jay comfortable saying that there is an intersubjective narrative self? Uh, it is just that it's not some metaphysical entity with identity conditions, i.e. we are constituted by social practices of being held accountable, of having various practical goals available, et cetera. And again, yeah, lots of careful work in the book to address these kinds of arguments, but maybe you can give a sense of some of that here. I can. Those are really good questions, too, as, as all of these have been. Um, this is the point about the snake and the elephant. Um, it's really easy in these conversations to start worrying about the snake and then say, oh yeah, but let's take a look at the fact that there's no big elephant here. Um, and these are examples of that particular strategy. That is, it's certainly true that we construct our personal identity through narrative and that our personal identity, our identity as persons is constructed socially, cognitively, transactionally in all of these ways. That doesn't make that a self. That makes that a person. Um, so that it certainly, when we start talking about what is it to be a person, we need to talk about the role of narrative. We need to talk about the role of intersubjectivity. We need to talk about the role of social cooperation. All of those are the processes that constitute us as persons. What they don't do is constitute us as selves. Um, and so it's really important to keep in mind the difference between what it is to be a person and a self. An analogy that I use frequently in the book is the analogy of an actor and a role. Um, you, just because Hamlet um, is somebody initially constructed by Shakespeare, shaped by the history of the play, adopted by Tom Stoppard and so forth as a character in his play and so forth, doesn't mean and has been played by Benedict Cumberbatch and by Sir Lawrence Olivier, doesn't mean that we can say, oh, Sir Lawrence Olivier is really a construction of Shakespeare and Tom Stoppard because here he is playing Hamlet. Nor do we want to say Benedict Cumberbatch was created by Shakespeare just because he played Hamlet. Um, so we don't, want to, we don't want to run together what's true of the role with what's true of the actor playing the role. Um, similarly, I don't want to run together what it is to be a person with what it is to be a self and say we can talk about what it is to be a person through intersubjectivity and convention and say, oh, let's just call that a self. Because what we're really worrying about when we worry about the self is the serpent in the wall. That's the thing we want to focus on because we don't instinctively think of ourselves as narrative, narratively constructed characters. We don't instinctively think of ourselves as intersubjectively constituted beings. That's an achievement from doing really reflective philosophy. And it's an achievement that enables us to weaken the sense that we really are a self. So I don't, I mean, it'd be easy to say to self person, they basically mean the same thing. I'm arguing about words. I don't think that's true. I think that once we pay attention to the object of this atavistic self-grasping, we see that it's really different from all of those ideas that you're celebrating. Um, Koshi Tharakan, sans the notion of a self, does the notion of an other make sense and vice versa? But if there is no other, does normative ethics make sense? Um, self and other are often taken to be um, ineliminably linked poles but I don't think they are. Um, I think that I can talk about I, you, we, them, where the reference of all of those are persons and not selves. So while I do think that, the, that it's only others who make me who I am, um, that's not to say that those others are other selves. Those others are other persons in the same kind of ensemble cast um, in which I am uh, performing my own identity. So I think that, again, I, I would agree that others are important. There's a, a great um, early 20th century Indian philosopher whose work I really enjoy, and I'm not necessarily recommending that you read, but you might want to, uh, Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, um, really interesting phenomenologist in early 20th century India. And he argues persuasively that first person self-consciousness presupposes second person consciousness. 
and that second person consciousness presupposes third person consciousness. Let me spell that out for, for a moment because I want you to see that none of this has to do with self. Um, when I use the word I to refer to who I am and constitute myself as a person, I only use that word if I'm talking to you, if I'm talking to Kiara in this, in this, um, in, in this uh, context. That's what language does, it addresses somebody else. So the word I only makes sense in address, but when I address somebody, I take that person to be somebody who could use I with respect to themselves and who would also take me to be addressing them when I do that. So that for me to even say I, I have to assume that somebody else is listening and that presupposes second person consciousness. But to do that, I have to presuppose that that person uses the same language that I do, that we follow the same rules. And that means I've got to presuppose a linguistic community of them who constitute the meaning the meaning giving conventions that make my linguistic activity my thought make any sense in the first place so i can't talk to kiara without us both being part of a broad community of english speakers and that requires third person consciousness that third person consciousness enables second person consciousness that enables first person consciousness now notice that all of that involved appeal to interdependence not appeal to independent self atoms interacting with one another. Um, here's a question I am especially interested to hear answered as well, um, mainly because I don't know much about it. Um, in terms of techniques of self or techniques of unself, isn't the only way out of self some acknowledgement of other power as evident in, for example, Shin Buddhism? And if you can, I don't know much about Shin Buddhism, if you can tell, tell me more about what the other power is that Amanda McBride is, is referencing yeah. in that question. Yeah, this gets really complicated really fast because um, it, and it's a, it's a good question again, but it's a really hard one because it gets us into the weeds of how to interpret Shin. Um, and the Shin tradition is really large. Um, and there's a big difference between say folk Shin religion and abstract Shin philosophy. So often when we talk about other power um, in, in Shin, um, it's sometimes thought of as just the power of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas or Amitabha to act on our behalf or to, or to save us in some sense. But we can also think um, in a more um, delicate way about other power in Shin as drawing our attention to the fact that the causes and conditions of a lot of our behavior and thought are not internal to us, but are external. So that who we are depends upon others. Um, and I think that that's a really, really powerful idea. Um, and it's an idea that can inspire gratitude. Um, and I think that gratitude is a really good emotion, by the way. <laughs> um, if you reflect on the fact that everything you know depends upon people who have taught you that stuff or who have discovered that stuff, um, that who you've become depends upon the kindness of your parents, your teachers, your friends, your family, um, you start recognizing that, you know, to use that um, vexed phrase, you didn't build this, where the this is you. Um, you didn't build yourself, you were con a collectively constructed object. And that's really where I see other power in Shin as getting its bite. And what that does is it kind of directs my attention constantly to interdependence and a sense of gratitude instead, instead of a sense of individual agency and, uh, and pride. Mm. And this is leading to what I, I think should be our last question. It comes from Lisa De Amato. Um, uh, and this person is asking, do we tend to lack the imagination to think that we can live in the world in a profoundly different way? What might it be like to live without a self? What might feel different? And if I may, I'd like to add um, to that question, have you ever met anyone who you, or, or had a student perhaps who successfully, um, you think embodied some of, some of the virtue of, of living more as a person than a self. Um, yeah, to, to concretize and start to tell the story of, of what it is to live without self. Yeah. Um, so Lisa's question, which I just love, always takes me back to the fact that I think you can do almost all of philosophy through Indigo Girls lyrics. Um, <laughs> And this is taking us to the great Indigo Girls song, Perfect World, right? Which um, ends, can we learn to live another way? Um, 
and it's talking about the uh, illusion of self and the um and interconnection right the line before that is connect the points and see the constellations right to understand that mm -hmm. you really are part of a constellation in a world and not an individual star um i'm confident that we can get better at being who we at, at, at who we are i'm not confident that we can become perfect <laughs> um i some of the people who I respect most profoundly are people who I respect because I think they've done an enormous um, amount of work to put their egos aside and so have been able to um, develop pro both profound understanding of who they are, but also profound um, intimacy and generosity towards others. Um, and when I think about the people for whom I have deep personal respect, um, it's people like that. Um, not necessarily the fastest, the strongest, or the smartest, um, but the ones who are able to really recognize and to reflect um, interdependence um, as opposed to um, egocentricity. <laughs>